I can't. I can't. Are you ready to check out some more Bobby Fischer games, man? They're going to be singularly improbable, awesome, stunning, unbelievable, phenomenal, extraordinarily astonishing, unusually wonderful, remarkably fabulous, and wondrous. They're going to be fantastic. <laughs> what do you think, bud? They're going to be cool? These Bobby Fischer games? He doesn't care. He doesn't know how to play chess. He, does, he can't do it. He can't do it to save his life. Uh, but I love him anyway. His name is Einstein. Like and subscribe, and uh, let's get into it. Some more Bobby Fisher games. Welcome, everybody. We're back after a, a week or so of absence, and uh, very excited to offer you some really cool content here. Um, kind of a, again, a review of Bobby Fisher's um, great wins, and at the same time, a little bit of history. Just knocked over my water bottle. Sorry. What's that? I just knocked over my water bottle on, on accident. I'm so excited about these games, I can't even contain myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, um, let's start with the first game uh, because it, it is kind of a, something really important. Actually, we can let's do it differently. Let's just actually review Bobby Bobby's game. It's a long game. We're not going to review all of it because the second half of it is is more or less kind of like a a wrap up. But uh, we'll review a second game, kind of see where it came from and how this uh, whole thing came about. It's a very well known game that Bob Fisher played when he was actually really young. If I'm not mistaken, in 1958, he was 14. Um, perhaps I'm, I'm wrong with a date here or, or not, but it was actually an amazing game. And I have a little bit of a, a history on this, is that Bobby I was a really voracious reader of all kinds of chess literatures, um, receiving magazines from uh, different countries. And I even heard that he even learned some basic Russian just to read Russian chess magazine. So um, in this situation here, uh, he was white and Ryshevsky was black. And I read that prior to this game, Bobby Fischer received a copy of a chess magazine and he uh, read it and uh, found a game there that was actually a predecessor to his own play. So um, his creativity here is learned, so to say, but nevertheless, it's a very nice and spectacular game with some really cool attack that was just kind of like a spark of a match, and boom, the game is over. So he was cool. playing Samuel Ryshevsky, um, a well-known chess player, U.S. champion uh, a few times, and uh, actually a well-known person in chess history. He actually was um, known that when he was seven or eight-year-old kid in Eastern Europe, he was actually giving simultaneous exhibitions to a group of adults. Wow. And beating them, and and beating most of them. Yeah, wow. And, uh, he actually um, earned a fair amount of money doing this because it was obviously a very rare sign, a child playing a bunch of adults. And at the time, everybody was wearing suit and a tie and all this, so it looked very exciting. Oh, and, nice! And in shorts and 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 some kind of tea, uh, playing a bunch of old men and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and winning games against them. <laughs> me, so, me. Yeah, in later years, it was actually a subject of jokes whenever he would play a bad game. Uh, his opponent said, well, when he was a kid, he played a lot better than this. <laughs> yeah. So, quite a bit of chess history. So, in this game, if we actually go back a little bit, Bobby played uh, white side of dragon, or in this particular case, accelerated dragon. And um, dragon Sicilian variation comes in two shapes. First, the classic dragon Sicilian is the one that goes like this. First they play g6, and after that they execute this bishop fianchetto. And against this play, there are many different ways to play. Bishop e3, bishop g7, f3 is what they call a main line. Then there's also variations where you castle short side, but we're not gonna spend time on that at this moment. And then there is accelerated dragon, the one that starts with knight c6. And there are some differences between the two and some really serious ones of that. Specifically, what is the biggest difference here with this position versus the one with a pawn on d6? The biggest difference is the availability of this move. Maroxy bind. Maroxy bind, named after a great chess player from Hungary, uh, Goza Maroxy, who uh, invented this setup for white. And, and the goal here is kind of set up a grip and hold the center really tight, preventing any kind of pawn movements there. 
and just slowly but surely improving the position and suffocating the opponent. Right. So if you look at this position here, that's a main difference between Accelerate Dragon and Dragon Proper, as they say. So uh, what does white do most of the time? Majority of the players, though, continue pretty much in the same fashion. Develop the knight, develop the bishop to e3, and what another thing that you need to what other thing you need to be remembering here is that if you play say bishop e2 without having to play bishop c4 uh, there are some positions where the other side can hit you with d5 and that's an extra move they don't have to spend when playing d6 so that's just an immediate thing so that's right. the second difference. so uh fisher of course was aware of all this and he played bishop c4 uh, castle, uh, bishop to b3. Now, um, what is this position all about? What's going on here? Quite a few things, actually. Um, I am not exactly sure is if this is the most precise move or if you want to play. Uh, Doesn't queen seem c4. like it. Just retreating the bishop all of a sudden? Uh, well, 95 is the move that seems to be like, oh, wait, well, let's get the bishop right away and then play d5. Seems like a good move and it was played in a few games, but the story I was telling about a chess magazine, Bobby opened up some chess magazine and received in the mail and saw a game there that basically refused this play. Knight a5 is, turns out to be just a bad move. Now, what should black do instead? Uh, well, probably just switch into a normal dragon with d6. Now, I'm not 100% sure of that move, uh, that drops the knight. What are you doing playing that move? I don't think that move is any good um, for white. Knight takes c6. But if you take here, then there's knight takes d4. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a variety of things available here. A d6, knight g4. Now, I'm not actually up to date on what the assessment is on knight g4, but the computer seems to think uh, that there is a bit of a push here uh, for white, uh, primarily because black pieces are kind of back over there, and the a7 pawn is a little compromised. And if you play a6, you have to watch out for knight d5 and bishop b6. So quite a few tricky things to consider here. So knight g4, maybe not the best move. I suspect the best move is probably d6. Just switching to dragon proper, and you know, not not trying to over trick everybody including yourself the engine agrees so, with it looks like yeah d6 yeah d6 seems to be the best now what happened here is um Ryshevsky played knight a5 and bobby here probably was pretty excited because i suspect you know a young kid playing a well-known entity a world championship uh, candidate you know u.s champion lots of titles and, and here's an opportunity to slam him in the mid, in the, just the start of the game. And he immediately played e5. Yeah. And cool. now, Ryshevsky looked at this position and probably realized that he can't really take on b3. Because after e takes f6, he has to take the rook. Because if he takes uh, the knight or takes the pawn, he loses material. So he has to take the rook. And then pawn takes on g7. And now what do you do? Rook is hanging. So you have to give up your uh, knight, probably. And in that situation, knight takes c2, king takes g7, and say something like queen d2. Does not look very friendly to black. Even though material appears to be OK, uh, the dark squares are really notoriously exposed. And then there is also h4, h5 possibility. Plus the fact that all the pieces are in the back rank, too. So variety of uh, problematic issues here. I wonder what the computer is thinking about this is. Well, see, the computer thinks that white is up three points. Wow. I didn't realize it was that bad. I'm not really... convinced. Let's see. It. How, how does white go on to win this? Well, first, bishop h6 is up in the air, so you have to retreat, right? You got to mm -hmm. go away. All right, bishop h6. So what do you do? Well, let's say you move the rook. You don't really want to lose it, do you? Castles. Very basic place so far. Now what do we do? We've got to get out somehow. Our pieces are all back. So let's say we go d6, a fair move, right? Mm-hmm, yep. Uh, the computer says uh, knight e3. Okay, fair enough. Let's Going into d5 or something, yeah. Six, knight d5. And if you look at this position, there are just not that many things that you can do. 
Uh, the biggest challenge here is just lack of, of anything that's active. Let's say you play rook c8. You bring another piece into the game. Queen d4. I have to play f6. Rook e1. And you kind of see that they're beginning to kind of slowly but surely gather a lot of space. Uh, the bishop needs to retreat. And then there she goes. Kapow. Yikes. And now Wait a second. It... I've got two attackers on that square. Rook takes. I know, but knight takes f6 is going to be a major problem. But I've won your rook. What are you up to? Well, I'm up to a discovered check here. Uh -huh. And after that check, there's just not too many good things you can do. King g8, queen g7, checkmate. I like it. That is really cool. So it, it's just a sample line. By all means, moves were not forced, but clearly the position looks very awful. Right, e5, powerful, powerful move there. Powerful move. So suddenly the options are uh, few in between, and this is actually classical discovered attack game, as you see here in just a little bit. Well, if you can't really go to a knight b3, what's the alternative? You could go to h5, but in that case, I think after g4, I think it's fair to say that knight's trip is over. Yeah. He's done. So Ryshevsky probably did not really suspect anything. He just moved back to e8 and thinking, you know, next move I'm going to take that pesky bishop, play d6, and life is good. And here, probably when he saw the next move, he fell off the chair. Oh, I have seen this. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really such a cool tactic. It's a really simple one if you think about it, but really kind of like hard to see in the game. Where does it come from? Well, you actually look at this and you see, okay, what are the attack possibilities? What are the defense possibilities? I would love to play knight e6, but obviously I can't force him to take with a d pawn. So he can take with an f pawn. But then what do I do? I take on e6, he moves the king to h8. What did I gain? Well, I gain absolutely nothing. nothing. Yeah, right, right. But then the thought scratches my head. Well, if the e f7 pawn wasn't there, wouldn't that be a great knight e6 move? And then after bishop f7, I remove that obstacle. Now, Mr. Ryshevsky played king to f7. Was rook f7 a better move? Not really. Not really. After knight e6, queen is gone. Yeah, queen's yeah. trapped, yeah. So king takes f7. The first time he plays, he was thinking, gee, what is this guy doing? Did he just blunder a bishop? <laughs> no, he didn't blunder a bishop. Knight e6. Yeah. And now the choices are not great. A, lose the queen. B, take a trip to the middle. Well, taking a trip to the middle is always a very, very dangerous undertaking. And after something like queen d5 check, king f5, all the kids that I ever worked with and gave this position to review always find the move g4 after a second or third try. Yeah. And now when the king travels that far off the road after rook g1, his trip is going to be extremely dangerous and very short. Right, right. This checkmate for sure coming up, yeah. Yep, checkmate coming up. So probably have to go to h5, and here is a choice of probably two or three different ways. My favorite is this. Ladder queen mate. Queen 2 yeah. And then three mates. Queen h3, queen g4, and queen g5. You can't possibly call it that many <laughs> Here yeah, right. with anything really. So at that moment here, probably Mr. Ryshevsky realized that he's been had. He basically got trapped into the opening trick. So that's and so cool. That's amazing. So so Bob Fisher taught himself how to speak Russian. He read a magazine in written in Russian and then used it against a, a world championship candidate to win this game. Something like that. Yeah. At least that's what I've read. I don't know if his story is 100 percent true, but I wouldn't yeah. surprise me because I know. Bobby subscribed to a lot of chess magazines from all over the world mm -hmm. and read just about every single thing from, you know, top to bottom. Yeah, well. Here he got the queen, and the game continues on for a while because, uh, objectively speaking, there is a bit for a queen. Not a lot, but two two pieces and a pawn. So it bought a couple of points short, but there's two bishops and uh, a lot of pawn cover. But Bobby just won this relatively quickly. He basically... Exercise is a classical thing. What do you do when you're ahead in material? You trade pieces. Look right. at that. He trades pieces. Well, his opponent tries to set up some tactics against him. 
uh, but the peace trade has completed nevertheless. Now, as a result of that, now if the light square bishop was, was in some more decent place, maybe it would have been some compensation, but you can't really even get him out yet. So Ryshevsky goes king g7, tries to open up the bishop with e5 in the next move, knight e4. Mm -hmm. Comes back to c7, now getting ready to play e5. Knight c5, rook f6, c3. Now, I'm not exactly sure why c3, because when I was looking at this, I was thinking maybe you could play rook a to e1. I couldn't really come up with any particular reason why this is not good. But um, Bob played c3. Uh, I suspect there are just not that many good choices for black in the first place, and the exact um, exact play here is not required. So c3, e5, and Bobby goes rook d1. Now, I know you said you want to wrap up this game fast and not really look at the end of it, but I, I'm, I'm still curious here. I want to see how this wraps up. Um, because, you know, uh, black sort of stopped white's attack a bit. How, how much material is white ahead right now? Um, uh, well, the computer says it's five points almost, but um, how many points? How many actual points of material? Uh, actual points is two points. Two points, okay. But so black's pieces are, are pretty well mobilized right now. The bishop's about to come out. I, I'd, I'd kind of like to see the end of this, yeah. Uh, totally, totally. The game continued. Of course, Ryshevsky fought very hard. He didn't want to lose to a kid really quickly because you know what? Well, you lost to a kid in 20 moves. <laughs> Now, knight d8, now, uh, I, I was wondering about that move. I'm thinking he's kind of desperate and he's trying to maybe play b6, bishop b7 or something. Oh, sure, yeah. Knight d7 by Bobby Fischer, forcing another piece trade, trying to trade the bishop for the knight. Rook c6, Bobby avoids that and strikes e7. He's very energetic. His style has always been very, very energetic. He never really, like, sits on his... Hence, he always goes for it. Yeah. Uh, rook e6, defended the pawn. Knight c5, get away from here. Rook f6. Now what did Bobby do? Knight e4. He continues to use the knight to just shake down upon his position. Now the biggest problem for black is that if you go to f7 or e6, let's say go to e6 just for example, knight goes to g5 and hits your game. h7, e6, and yeah. h7, and e6. And the same thing is for rook f7. You go to f7, knight g5. So what do you do? He goes rook f4. But you know when you have a, have a move like that and lose another pawn, obviously things do not go your way. Mm -hmm. And here Bobby goes queen a3. He just gets the queen away from everything. Um, inflicted a lot of damage in the position. Threatens knight d6, but just puts the queen into safety. Avoiding, you know, if you go to c5, maybe knight d6 can be played or... If you go queen b4, maybe knight c6 came to play. So just played it in a safe place and threatens knight d6 again. This is making and sense, but but yeah, at least quickly. I, I want to see how this finishes for sure, yeah. Knight c6, knight d6. Again, no, notice how he kind of methodically trades away pieces. One after one, uh, not rushing with anything else, not trying to run big attacks. Just right. kind of actively trades pieces. Now, when you trade it off a bishop pair and, and essentially have... Um, Queen for two minors, the win has become uh, more or less a technical matter. So now he begins to chase the knight off and starts employing his pawn formation. He has an extra pawn in a queen side area, so he might as well use it. Uh, attacks the pawn on e5, knight of seven, and rook c5, basically positioning the rook for the invasion. You don't want to allow invasion? Well, Trade the rooks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so really that great choice already. So he goes a6, now b6, and he does get uh, to tag the bishop again. So the bishop goes to c6. Now what do you do? Because Ravestri has think... really slowed down the attack by, by quite a bit, you know? Yes, but uh, there's just not too many pieces left to slow down things with. That's but, yeah, now, now Bobby Fisher's kind of remaneuvered, and now he's ready to attack again, though, and, and get that pawn pushed, yeah. Yeah, he just sacks the rook, just removes that defender and pushes the pawn and takes another one. So a small sacrifice, but this way he secures himself a couple more pawns and uh, queen versus a rook and knight with a couple of pawns extra in the pocket is not a tough, not a tough position to win right. for that caliber. Um, defense the extra pawn, doesn't let it slip. 
Rook F7, so it says, well, if you want to trade, you're welcome to trade, but it's going to cost you a few more material. H3, now finally the pawn got captured, but now you've got another problem. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, resigned. Why did he resign? Well, uh, let's just say he plays um, Rook D7, right? Defense the knight. A4. Yeah, it's become a lot simpler now. You're just going to advance that pawn. Yeah. Advance the pawn. Let's say the king goes there and tries to help out. He doesn't really have the capacity here to really do anything. Right. So you right. can see that the pawn runs pretty much unobstructed until e6. And then what do you do? You, you have to give up your rook for it after it gets to e7. Right. Now, could you stop it earlier? Sure, you can try to play knight b7. Uh, but it's not going to really stop anybody for any serious amount of time because after queen c8, you're still going to have trouble all the same, or even just a5. There's no particular reason to stop now. Right. Makes sense. Because you, if you go rook d1, king h2, the knight is undefended. So you, you're going to have to give up the knight. Mm -hmm. and now your rook is facing the queen in a very sad prospects. Right. Game right. Yeah. So, Game over. Makes so, sense. Yeah. What made this combination a success? A couple of things. Now, I've noticed, and it happened in many games, in my games, and the games that I was on the wrong side of the game, um, when you don't set up any pawn cover in the center and you have unlimited pawn mobility for your opponent's pawns in the middle, that always allows them to make a run at your pieces at will. Wait, let's, and, let's go all the way back to the, the beginning. Now. Let's, let's do a, a formal recap then. So, so what, 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 what was the summary here? So first of all, in this position here, I think the biggest error that was made, there was no challenge set up for white pawn in the center. Like this move would have disallowed most of this. It would have connected the bishop to the game. It would protect g4 square for say something like knight g4 in the next move. You can play bishop d7, rook c8. So essentially what black started here is unsupported aggression here, um, advanced the knight out, tries to attack upon in spaces, but his own territory has not been secured. He doesn't have the pawn set up in the center to restrict white pieces. And, and that's what you normally need to have the pawns in the middle for. You need to have pawns in the middle to restrict opponent's pieces. Otherwise, they run at you and it's unrestricted. In this case, the, run, the pawn started the run. And now if you actually look at this position, it, it looks kind of funny. It feels like black is setting up for a new game almost. Like all the pieces <laughs> are in the black row except for the knight. And after bishop f7, another I item here that is uh, somewhat tricky to spot if you're not used to it is you, you have a, a collateral position here with lots of pieces around the queen and not a lot of mobility. So it seems like it sure, it sure is fascinating because it, it looks like it's pretty solid. I mean, you would think that white's going to play f4 here. It's really that bishop takes f7 move that's just so crushing. Yeah, it just kind of in the middle of nowhere, boom, and you just knocked off the chair right here. So, right. again, what was the critical thing that was done wrong? The pawn belongs to d6 before you do any knight a5. Right, right. Now, the pawn is there, and let's say white did something like this. Is knight a5 the best move? Not necessarily, but you're never going to lose quickly here. Right, good good contrast there, yeah. A lot of squares available. Nobody is clattered and stuck behind. Right. All and right, so to wrap it up, what's, what's one more takeaway? One more takeaway from this whole game. Always put the pawns in the center. Do not start aggression before you do so. I like it. Sounds good. Cool. Should we call it there? Uh, well, uh, one more thing I wanted to show you guys that where did this all come from? You know, sometimes you kind of look at the game and think, wow, what a cool stuff. What a great combination. What a fantastic thing. But when you actually look at it, you realize that maybe this, this whole thing has happened before. And um, I don't really see the game in the listing, but I sent you a game between uh, uh, a relatively unknown player and uh, Dr. Tarsh. Mm-hmm. And Dr. I would love to see it. I think we should make a separate video for that one. What do you think? Okay, we can do that. All right, sounds good. Thank you guys. We're going to end this one here. Um, you know, like and subscribe and uh, donate. We, we would appreciate it. We want to keep this stuff going. So there's a PayPal link below. All right. Thanks, Yorgi. Thank you, Ryan. We'll talk soon.